With the US presidential election just days away, how much of an impact will its result have on NATO and security within Europe? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, last time Donald Trump was in office, he threatened to pull out of NATO if European defence spending did not increase. With the alliance affected by war on its borders, what difference would a Trump or a Kamala Harris victory actually make? All eyes in Europe are eagerly awaiting the outcome of the US election. Its result could change much particularly the future of the transatlantic alliance. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has long been skeptical of NATO, but its new leader, Mark Rutte, has expressed no fear of change. I'm not worried. Um, uh, I know both candidates very well. Many believe Donald Trump's re-election would disrupt transatlantic relations. He has criticized European allies for not spending enough on defense and suggested leaving NATO. Trump also claims he would resolve the Ukraine conflict and is hesitant to commit to additional U.S. aid to the country. So we have a very good relationship, and I also have a very good relationship, as you know, with President Putin. And I think uh, if we win, I think we're going to get it resolved very quickly. But the Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris has positioned herself as a strong supporter of NATO. Trump, on the other hand, threatened to abandon NATO. He encouraged Putin to invade our allies. She has also pledged continuous support for Kiev. Whoever takes office next January, one thing is certain, NATO is poised to enter a new chapter. Well, let's meet our guests. Joining us from Brussels is Jamie Shea. He is former Deputy Assistant Secretary General of NATO. In Washington, D.C., we have David Desroches. He is a former official in the U.S. Department of Defense, and he also worked on European security issues and as NATO operations director. And from Camberley in the U.K., we have Martin Smith. He's a senior lecturer in defense and international affairs. That's at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. Jamie, I'll come to you first. I mean, Europe is in a much more vulnerable place than it was last time around when we had a U.S. election this is quite an intriguing time if Donald Trump takes power. Well, uh, Ender, thanks for having me back on. Certainly, it will be a rough ride. Let's not uh, kid ourselves uh, about that, uh, because uh, Trump is inconsistent on some things. But one area where he has been pretty consistent uh, over the uh, the last uh, six, uh, eight years or so since he uh, first occupied the White House has been NATO, criticism of the Europeans, of course, for inadequate uh, defense spending, over-reliance upon the United States, uh, and, of course, uh, what he considers to be the uh, excessive amounts that the United States has been paying on weapons to uh, Kiev to support Ukraine. So uh, certainly uh, that means that uh, once again, the Europeans are going to have to come up with an effective Trump strategy, how to handle the president, uh, so that the rough ride does not turn into a catastrophic ride. But on the other hand, Ender, uh, of course, you know, uh, many European leaders remember Trump's first administration. They remember, of course, that uh, making the arguments to him over time, uh, as the former NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg did when it came to 2% of GDP on defense, defense spending, uh, the European effort. Uh, over time, that could have an uh, impact on, on Trump. Uh, and, and so, Certainly, uh, the Europeans, of course, uh, look much better in that respect today, with 23 allies meeting that 2% target, than it did with the three or four allies during Trump's first term. So the Europeans have got some good arguments, but they need to find good interlocutors who can get uh, Trump's trust, but who can represent Europe, but also uh, be an effect effective communicators in the United States. That's going to be, of course, be a big job for the new Secretary General Mark uh, Rutter. Uh, also, people like Georgia Maloney of Italy. Uh, on the far right, but uh, Atlanticist, uh, uh, pro-American. Um, we need more of these kind of people, and, and we need their skill in making the case to the uh, incoming second Trump presidency, if that's what we get after next Tuesday. David, a lot of Europeans will be asking the question, can we still count on the United States? If Trump wins, can we? Yeah, yeah, you can. 
Um, but you can't count on them to be unreserved and you can't count on them to be uncritical. So um, I think that it's worth worthwhile to revisit uh, Donald Rumsfeld's formulation of old Europe and new Europe. New Europe, the countries that were uh, incorporated in the Warsaw Pact or, or were incorporated in the Soviet Union, uh, generally um, are responsible for their own defense, are uh, aggressively um, promoting national security, and uh, are consonant. And I think they're the people who are probably going to make the case uh, more effectively to Trump and his administration, as Jamie said. I think that a lot of Trump's bluster is really just negotiations, uh, regardless of the party, regardless of even the personalities. U.S. support for NATO has been remarkably constant, but U.S. dissatisfaction with Europeans not contributing adequately to their own defense has also been remarkably constant. And I think that um, uh, rather than an animus towards NATO, what we ought to look at this as is um, a negotiation tactic, but also an expression of uh, looking into the future at some point that the United States cannot be relied upon to defend Europe if Europeans won't do it themselves indefinitely. But this talk of a withdrawal or a retreat, I think, is overblown. Martin, I just want to ask you, we've heard some talk recently about European countries Trump-proofing themselves in advance in case he wins this US election. What kind of measures do you think they've been taking or what have they been thinking about doing? Well, I think the main one is is one that Jamie um, alluded to. And actually, if I can just for a second loop back to your, your, your opening question. In, in one important respect, I think actually European NATO members in particular are actually in a better place now uh, facing a potential second Trump presidency than they were in, in 2016, because as Jamie Porter pointed out, whereas then barely a quarter of the then NATO membership actually met the agreed 2% annual defence spending target. Uh, today, um, as Mr. Stoltenberg, the former Secretary General, announced at the uh, the last NATO summit over the summer, over two thirds of them do. So I think that the main, there are two types of Trump proofing measure. Um, uh, the main one is to be seen to either be meeting uh, the uh, the two percent target, which don't forget is an agreed. It's not a Trump imposed target. It was agreed by all of the then NATO members in 2014 in the aftermath of the first Russian military incursion um, uh, uh, in Ukraine earlier uh, that year. So it's an agreed. NATO target uh, and the numbers of European uh, NATO members either meeting or move, demonstrably moving towards meeting that target has grown significantly as we've just uh, uh, discussed. So that is the main Trump proofing measure. I think secondarily and with specific regard for Ukraine, um, there has been again an evident um, effort to institutionalize the means and the mechanisms and the framework within which Western military aid and assistance is channeled to Ukraine. So again, over the summer, um, a decision was taken to move from the informal so-called Ramstein group uh, approach convened by the United States, but basically relying not, not on any sort of structure or framework and not being directly associated with NATO. That's now changed, and that process has been, number one, um, institutionalized in the so-called Ukraine Support Contact Group, and number two, associated now directly with NATO. So I think there's a, there's a two-pronged effort that has been underway, both with reference to NATO as the central focus um, of Western assistance uh, to Ukraine, but also individual NATO member states, recognising that, to be fair, Mr. Trump did have a valid point in terms of most of them, when he first took office, failing to meet their own agreed defence spending target. So two efforts have been underway. Um, my sense is I would tend to, again, be uh, err on the, on the positive side if Mr. Trump does take office again from next January, my sense is that they will have a significant mitigating and influencing impact on shaping his attitudes towards NATO and European security going forward. Martin, let's bring Jamie back in on that. Jamie, do you think Trump was right to kind of rattle the sword a bit and shake these European countries up, the ones he claims are not pulling their weight 
in terms of spending? Well, if you're Donald Trump, and I did uh, have the opportunity to meet him on a couple of occasions during NATO summits, you would certainly say that uh, you used uh, shock therapy uh, and it was unpleasant, of course, uh, for the Europeans to be on the receiving end, even if... Uh, as David and Martin have rightly pointed out, they themselves uh, took on the obligation of spending 2% of GDP on defence for their own security, for their own self-interest, given the more dangerous uh, security environment in Europe. It wasn't about just being nice to the Americans. If you're Donald Trump, you'd probably say, well, look, you know, I had to use some rough tactics, but uh, it worked. Uh, it got the attention of, of, of these people and they started to uh, turn around a situation which had not been satisfactory uh, for uh, many, many uh, uh, years. Um, and uh, the, the statistics uh, prove that. Although Joe Biden, with his softer approach, could probably also argue that under his watch, uh, the Europeans have continued to spend a lot uh, on, on defence. Um, that The driving factor there is not so much Trump, of course, but Putin and his invasion of the Ukraine and the various Russian hybrid warfare tactics being currently used against uh, 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 Europe. But there are still some laggards. Uh, 23 is still... Uh, uh, not the 32 uh, NATO member states. Uh, so there are still nine to go. That's a significant number, including the neighbor of the United States to the north, Canada. Um, so there's a lot of work to do to keep the pressure up there. Some countries, in fact, in NATO, it has to be said, have also gone back uh, on their defense uh, uh, spending, moving away from the 2% target. And Donald Trump, uh, uh, when I was uh, at a meeting with him in Brussels uh, before I uh, left NATO during the uh, middle of, of his presidency, did hint that uh, maybe 3% or 4% uh, was really now the realistic figure, uh, given the modernization that NATO forces still need to accomplish. And if you look, uh, Ender, at Central and Eastern Europe, David mentioned that. Yes, you've got Poland which is above 4%. Uh, today, I saw that Lithuania, uh, albeit a small country, but is going for 3.5%. Uh, so some of some of the allies are uh, way ahead of 2%, while others are below it. And I think if Trump comes in and says, look, you know, let's now raise this level to 3% or 4%, uh, that would put some of the uh, European allies under, under duress. David, we've heard Donald Trump call President Zelensky of Ukraine the greatest salesman in history, We've heard his supporters criticize the amount of US dollars that go to Ukraine. We, we never really hear Americans complaining about the $50 billion that has gone to Israel in the last year or so. I mean, what, why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First off, there is a lot of complaints about Israel, but it tends to be uh, among younger uh, people in America, people who uh, basically came of age after the Cold War and uh, don't speak of the Arab-Israeli conflict, they speak of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, I think that when you look at Trump, though, at the core of Trump, and, and Trump's followers seem to be a very, very broad tent indeed, um, I think that really the, the core of their criticism is twofold. The first is uh, there is some resentment over the role of Ukraine in the first impeachment of Trump, which you recall that was all about uh, uh, various machinations in U.S. support for Trump during the Obama administration. And I think there's some resentment of that at a personal level. I think the bigger issue, though, is dissatisfaction with the Biden administration's uh, strategy, or I would argue lack of strategy, which, uh, you know, has they've never laid out a clear vision for victory in Ukraine. Uh, what they've done is waited for the Ukrainians to ask for something, denied it for a period of time, then given it to them. And uh, over time, that erodes support for what is a very, very valid cause, because people say, well, we gave them Bradley fighting vehicles and the war still goes on. So I, th I think that at its core, it comes down to, as it often does with Donald Trump, to him personally, the impeachment, and then to criticism of the man who replaced him in the White House for their uh, lack of strategic thinking and lack of laying out a plan for victory in Ukraine. Martin, I read a very interesting quote from the outgoing Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, about Donald Trump. He was asked for some advice for European leaders, and Stoltenberg said, don't fear him, work with him. I mean, that's got to be good advice, isn't it, if he becomes president? I think it's very good advice, and I think the uh, uh, the, the the benefits of that approach were uh, were evident during Donald Trump's first term. And again, as we've alluded to early in our, our conversation, uh, notwithstanding all the talk before, during, and since 
the first Trump presidency uh, about his interest in, in seeking to withdraw the United States uh, from NATO altogether. Number one, nothing of the kind uh, evidently happened. And number two, uh, he continued and the Trump administration continued to play full and active roles, NATO politically. American representatives turned up to meetings of the North Atlantic Council. The president attended NATO um, uh, summit meetings. Yes, he brought his particular brand of, shall we say, robustuous personal politics to bear. But the, the point is that he continued to engage and to um, engage um, uh, uh, um, actively. So I think that for their part, European political leaders, as opposed to opposition leaders and, 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 and uh, many commentators, uh, recognise quite rightly that they need, whether, whatever they thought of the outcome of the 2016 election, Donald Trump was the duly elected um, uh, president, and they would have to um, respond to that and deal with him for at least four years. And I think, actually, it's to the credit of both sides that when you cut through the rhetoric and, and European leaders got used to, shall we say, Mr. Trump's personal style, they were able to make NATO uh, work effectively and they were able to achieve um, what they did in terms of entrenching, not perfectly as Jamie's pointed out, but significantly entrenching the core 2% target and commitment to an extent that I suspect had Donald Trump not won in 2016 may well not have proven to be the case. And another point, if I may, uh, which is, is often overlooked, um, is the, the ramping up of NATO's military effort after 2014, after the Russian incursion in Ukraine, when NATO members agreed to establish the EFP, the Enhanced Forward Present, Enhanced Military uh, Involvement and Commitments by Allied States uh, to Poland and the three Baltic states. That was initially established by the Obama administration, but far from uh, curtailing it or scrapping it all together, during the course of the Trump administration, the amount of funding, albeit at very low levels, we're talking about the difference between three and a half billion uh, and around $7 billion. Uh, but the fact remains that the Trump administration actually doubled the amount of funding to sustain the American commitment to NATO's enhanced forward presence. So engagement, I think the lesson to take from the first Trump engagement is absolutely Donald Trump can be engaged, um, should be engaged. And when he is engaged, uh, the, the, the results in terms of um, continuing U.S. commitment to NATO um, can be positive and reassuring for all concerned. Jamie, do you think Trump 2.0 might be easier to work with than first time round? I mean, we know he's predictably unpredictable, but if he wins this time round, do you think it just might be a bit easier? Well, certainly, uh, and uh, he's going to be focused very much on American domestic politics. He's made big promises about reducing inflation, getting the uh, petrol price or the gas price down at the pump, uh, dealing, of course, with the issue of uh, illegal migration from Latin America, uh, whether he expels large numbers of illegal Im uh, migrants or, or not. So that's going to keep him pretty busy. And the second thing, of course, is that uh, he and many Republicans and many Democrats believe that China is now the principal adversary of the United States. So there's going to be a lot of doubling down on, on that. Um, and of course, uh, thirdly, uh, when it comes to uh, Europe, I think his main interest is going to be in trade tariffs uh, and therefore the relationship between the United States and the European Union as last time round when it came to subsidies and tariffs and trade and standards and all of these kind of things, particularly, for example, in the area of uh, Elon Musk and social media regulation, those issues could feature more prominently than maybe the defence issues in NATO. But, Andrew, I will say two things. The first time round, there were sort of two guardrails in all of this that prevented the worst from happening, although I agree with what's been said about engaging the Donald Trump. He does listen. Don't talk about Trump proofing, by the way. He hears that and he takes that uh, as an insult. Let's adopt a much more positive. I'm not criticizing anybody for using that expression today because it's widely used. But I think it's wrong for Europeans to talk about Trump proofing. Uh, first of all, we can't do that. Uh, we need the United States for our defense and our security, even with Europe spending more. That reality is not going to change. And we need a more positive narrative about working with the Americans. But end of the last time round, the two guardrails were number 
one, there were many internationalist Republicans in the Congress, both in the Senate and in the House, NATO supporters. They even introduced in the Senate uh, legislation to prevent uh, to prevent the president from withdrawing unilaterally from NATO. And they also voted the uh, defense credits uh, for uh, Ukraine. Will these people be around uh, uh, after next uh, Tuesday, uh, will they? Uh, will the Republicans have control of the House still and the Senate? So I think the Congress thing can't be left out of the picture. And then secondly and finally, Ender, uh, of course, we know that Trump picked some pro-NATO generals, <laughs> many of them. They didn't necessarily survive for long, but they were there. Um, secretaries of State, secretaries of Defense who were broadly pro-NATO and were able, as Martin said earlier, to keep all of the day-to-day -day activities running. So we'll have to wait and see how all of these things uh, uh, play out. But the fact of the matter is, is that Europe needs to demonstrate to the United States how useful they are. Now, we don't have Afghanistan any longer um, uh, to show the Americans that in return for NATO defense, Europeans are willing to support the United States on overseas missions, uh, as in the days of Iraq or Afghanistan. So the Europeans need to find other ways, China policy, Asia Pacific, terrorism, Middle East diplomacy to demonstrate to the United States that in return for American defense of Europe, uh, the Americans get a lot of benefits in terms of allies for uh, global engagement. David, we keep hearing the phrase America first. I mean, in Europe, should we be worried about a Trump administration being very isolationist? Well, that's always a, a tendency. And I think that... Uh, it, it would be hard for isolationism to reassert itself, given the uh, international situation right now. But the, the bigger issue is uh, not in the short term Trump, but rather long term. It's about uh, generational attitudes. And I think Europe needs to be very careful that a narrative is not allowed to set in place that, you know, Europe doesn't take its defense seriously and relies upon the United States. Um, that will be a problem. And when there is a domestic challenge that requires resources or a challenge in China or the Middle East that requires resources, it will be hard for European defense planners to argue for scarce resources. If you know you, you look at things like the Germans with their generational uh, underinvestment in defense, it, it, it's hard to argue that we should sacrifice our interests elsewhere for people who are unwilling to defend themselves appropriately. So um, this, this transcends Trump, and uh, Trump would be very, very unhappy to hear that anything transcends him. But uh, it's, it's something that Europeans need to take very seriously, and it requires a shift in the general zeitgeist of uh, post-war or post-Cold War European thinking. Martin, just briefly, do you think some European leaders would be very happy if Kamala Harris wins this election? I, I think undoubtedly um, uh, that is the case uh, on, on a personal and political basis. But I think in terms of the issues we're talking about here, and uh, whoever wins, I think European NATO members uh, will, 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 will need to deal with two ongoing challenges. The first is the one that we've been talking about here, um, uh, uh, to, to, to maintain and indeed move either further towards or even beyond, um, uh, as Jeremy was suggesting earlier, the agreed 2%. Um, defence spending commitment because I think even the Kamala Harris presidency is not going to row back uh, on that and, and, and ease off the pressure. She might be, uh, her um, uh, advisors and officials might be more discreet and diplomatic about it, but I think they will seek to maintain the pressure on European NATO allies, not just because of the continuing conflict in Ukraine, but I think also, I think this is the second key strategic driver, if you will, that's not going to change, regardless of the outcome uh, next week, is the US increasingly identifying and focusing on China as its principal international um, strategic, economic and potentially um, uh, security challenge and competitor. And apropos of that, again, I think whoever wins uh, next week will continue that process and will, as part of that, expect European NATO members to continue to step up both financially uh, in terms of their operational um, military um, contributions to the defence of each other 
in the um, European context, as well as to uh, at least maintain the um, level and nature of their own contributions to the um, um, uh, to the defence of Ukraine. So. I don't think we should dramatise and over-exaggerate the differences in these core strategic issues between the, uh, the, the um, uh, possibility of Donald Trump coming back for a second term or the possibility of Kamala Harris being elected for a first term. I think whoever wins, European leaders and European NATO members will still have to face those pressures and those challenges um, coming from the United States. And just finally, Jamie, do you think a lot of European leaders would be happy if Harris just wins this and they can start afresh? Well, I, I find myself uh, uh, predictably agreeing with Martin once again on, on this. Uh, the realities are the realities. I mean, even under a democratic Biden administration, it took six months for the administration to persuade Congress, including many Democrats, to uh, uh, allocate a further $61 billion uh, to uh, Afghanistan uh, because of all of the other pressures on the United States budget at the moment. So I think Martin's right. Those fundamental realities of uh, economic uh, uh, stretch at home uh, are not going to go away. The Europeans are going to have to do more for Afghanistan, including if Harris wins. I don't think Harris also has the same sort of transatlanticist DNA, you know, turning up at the Munich Security Conference every year, as Joe Biden did uh, for 40 years since his time in the uh, uh, Senate. She is going to have other priorities. And like Trump, she's going to be focused, I think, very much on Renew America, the domestic uh, agenda. Jamie, on that note, thank you and goodbye also to David and Martin as well. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, for me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.